Okay, we are recording in live. Good morning, my name is Dr. Tim Hess. I would like to welcome you to the WAGD Stay Home, Stay Healthy CE Series. Today, uh, we've got a presentation, COVID-19 update on relief provisions back in business May 18th. Uh, we'd like to thank Tyler Jones, Kevin Bray, Brian Bray, Brenton Bray, uh, and the dental accounting pros for putting this seminar on. Uh, we've got over 600 people signed up for this uh, webinar today. So if you have a question, please type your question in the Q&A section of the Zoom, not in the chat section, please. Um, we will do our best to get to as many questions as possible, but quite frankly, with over 600 people on this webinar, uh, the chances of your question being answered fully are, are not great. Uh, we'll do our best to group the uh, questions together. Uh, we'll allow uh, our presenters to do their presentation and maybe interrupt them here and there with one or two questions. And then when we get to the end, uh, we will handle the Q&A at that time. For those of you that um, are AGD members uh, and, and are looking for CE credit, um, we're going to be uh, submitting your CE to the Academy of General Dentistry. That will not show up on your transcript for two to four weeks. Uh, the rest of you that have registered, you will receive uh, an email with your CE certificate with, within one or two days. Uh, sometimes it takes a little longer than that. As uh, the slideshow is going by here, I would encourage you to look at some of our upcoming webinars. We've got uh, 11 more scheduled here uh, in the next week and a half, and we're working on the weeks after. So there's a lot of great content. Um, if you're interested, you can get to the registration for those webinars via the uh, WashingtonAGD.org or you can use the QR codes that appear on each flyer. Those should take you to the registration page. And please remember, this is free CE. This is open to any dentist and their staff members as a member benefit and uh, from the Washington Academy of General Dentistry. Now, we'd like to thank our sponsors today. Uh, of course, Benton Bray, the Dental Accounting Pros, and also the Washington Academy of General Dentistry that's bringing you the WAGD Stay Home, Stay Healthy CE series. We'd also like to thank the University of Washington School of Dentistry CE Department. We'd like to thank the Canadian Academy of Restorative Dentists and Prostodontics, Comet USA, Patterson, Pierce County Dental Society, Seattle King County Dental Society, and the Snohomish County Dental Society. Also, for those of you uh, from the Arkansas AGD, the California AGD, and Texas AGD, thank you for joining us today. This uh, webinar today is being broadcast live on Facebook, so uh, you have the access to it that way as well as through Zoom. Uh, also, just a reminder today, we've got two more uh, webinars uh, at 
one o'clock p.m. We got we have Dr. Alan Yassine speaking on dental implants, delayed complications, and periimplantitis. And then at three o'clock today, my good friend Dr. Ralph Schuler that's going to be speaking on multiple implants in the aesthetic zone. This is a real wonderful lecture. You'll want to tune in. That's three o'clock. And again, there is CE credit for anybody that wants to attend. Use those QR codes as they come around to register for this CE event. We're just checking. So far, we've got about 300 people uh, logged into this uh, Zoom presentation. We're just going to give it a couple of minutes so everybody can get in and um, uh, get situated and familiar with the Zoom format. Uh, I know a lot of us have not done Zoom or the WebExes and that in the past, and it can be a little confusing at time. But just play with the interface. You'll find uh, your Q&A buttons. You'll find your chat buttons. Again, I want to emphasize, if you have a question, do not put it in the chat. Please use the Q&A. We're also not going to use the hands up function today as well. We'll moderate the questions as they come in and uh, we will feed those to our uh, presenters uh, if it's appropriate to interrupt them. If not, we will wait till the end of the presentation and then we will uh, do a Q&A uh, session then. I again want to emphasize that these uh, fellows, the, our presenters, are donating their time. All our presenters on the WAGD Stay Home, Stay Healthy CE series have donated their time. There's no honorariums being paid. We appreciate that uh, and supporting our organization. Want to welcome all our students from the University of Washington School of Dentistry student chapter that are joining us today. Uh, thanks for jumping on board. Um, and just a reminder, we have more CE this week. We have uh, Lois Banta tomorrow. We have Dr. Gian Kim. And uh, who else do we have? Let me just see here. Uh, oh, and Dr. Bruce Cassius. Uh, uh, we've just added a webinar series or a webinar of his. Uh, he'll be speaking on lasers. So thank you very much, Dr. Cassius, for doing that for us. Uh, well, we're coming up on the hour here. Let's just check how our numbers are. Okay, so we're getting to where we need to be. So uh, just we're going to briefly introduce our speakers. Uh, I'd like to welcome the Brays, Tyler Jones, and the rest of the crew uh, there uh, at Bray and Associates. Um, just a reminder, these are not your CPAs. These are gentlemen that are here to do their best to answer some of your questions. Some of your questions will need to be directed to your attorneys, your CPAs. They will not be able to answer everybody's questions involving their individual circumstances. So having said that, we still greatly appreciate them spending their time uh, and, and sharing their knowledge with our members. And we wanna welcome all the individuals that are not members of the AGD. We invite you to join the Academy of General Dentistry. We have some great uh, webinars coming up. We have some great uh, CE programs once we get past this COVID-19, um, uh, I guess you'd say pandemic, because that's what it is. So uh, with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And I want to welcome Benton and Bray and the Dental Accounting Pros. And thank you again, gentlemen, for donating your time. Please, if you have questions, your questions go in the Q&A uh, area, not in the chat area. Uh, thank you very much. Welcome, Brian, Kevin, Tyler. Good morning, all. Give us a sec here to share the screen and we'll get going. All right, good morning all. We're back for, I think this is our fourth session if I recall. Uh, with me here, so I'm Brian Bray. With me here is my partner, Tyler Opp. 
Uh, and obviously Kevin Bray, who runs the Dental County Professionals side of our shop. And then also remotely, we get Tyler Jones, who has been a great help in participating in these uh, these webinars, you know, keeping everybody up to date on uh, CARES Act and various relief provisions. Hey, Rod. So like Dr. Hess said, this is uh, information, general information. Doesn't necessarily apply to your specific situations. You need to huddle with your advisors to work out the best kind of course of action for your individual practices. Okay, since uh, since our last broadcast about, what, two weeks ago, I believe, uh, the CARES Act, you know, was launched and the Triple P loan program was launched with much gusto, as I'm sure you have, uh, you've seen in the press. So today we're going to update on the Triple P loan program, uh, cover some general information on unemployment benefits specifically for owners based on the uh, volume of uh, questions we've been getting on that. Hopefully this will kind of set everybody straight and just wait, have a little patience. We're going to cover the idle grants quickly, uh, extend tax deadlines, and then some other miscellaneous tidbits on relief provisions. Okay, we're going to jump into the Triple P loan, the Paycheck Protection Program loans. Just as a quick uh, kind of refresh, these loans turned out to be uh, based 100% on payroll costs. Uh, as, a, as, as all of you who have actually applied for the loans saw through the documentation, it was a 2.5x your average monthly payroll cost. Uh, the loan proceeds are actually allowed to be used for payroll costs and or related benefits, some payroll taxes, rent utilities, and interest on certain debt obligations. Lenders, as uh, I'm sure some of you have run into uh, and experienced, uh, have been overwhelmed with volume of applications, but seem to be cutting through the application process rather quickly. Uh, some of the key dental lenders in our area here, we've, you know, heard have turned off accepting applications, or I should say taken a pause, and, you know, allowed their team to get caught up on applications, and uh, then, you know, continue to accept new applications. Wells Fargo in particular basically shut down, and I believe as of today, they're still, they're back up now, accepting applications? I'm not sure. Not sure. Um, I know it was frustrating for all of you to have been in close communication with your bankers and, you know, wake up the next day or a few days later and get ready to, to submit your trip to the loan application only to find out that the bank has taken a pause and was not accepting it. There are a few online banks uh, that are being referred out. Uh, I also encourage you to check with your local community banks. We have found a few here in the Seattle, Bellevue, Everett, Tacoma metro area that uh, have stepped up and are taking triple P loan applications even from non-existing customers. So a quick update uh, that was published yesterday, you know, so where, where are we with the triple P loan apps that have been approved? Uh, SBA puts out a report about every day, every other day. Uh, the report that came out yesterday reflecting loans through April 13th or Monday, was a little over a million applications had been approved totally in about $248 billion of the $349 billion um, bucket of money. Based on our back of the napkin math, I uh, it calculates out to 20 to 25 billion per day 
is what's being uh, processed and approved. So that leaves uh, about a week uh, left to uh, exhaust the $349 billion bucket of money. We're going to come back later and talk about what Congress, you know, and what the folks back in D.C. are doing about that. Uh, our big focus today is going to be is going to be on the um, the payback and the forgiveness part of the triple P loans. Up up until now, it's it's been on you know the application process with banks, and I'm sure many of you have learned it's been basically gathering your payroll reports. Uh, about a week ago, there was some false starts on to you know regarding how the average monthly payroll numbers were calculated. The Treasury issued some clarification on that, and all of us got on board with uh, calculating those monthly payroll amounts correctly and consistently across, I would say, pretty much, pretty much most of the lenders, right? Yeah, I think many of the lenders are still using outdated formulas, but for the most part, we've been able to kind of reason them into uh, our interpretation of and it's not just our interpretation, the AICPA's interpretation and the Treasury's interpretation of how this is supposed to work. So uh, some of the smaller banks, quite frankly, um, have still been, in fact, we just saw one on Monday that was still using the original calculation from two weeks ago, uh, but we got that straightened out relatively quickly. The, the significance of that is that original calculation was uh, underestimating uh, your payroll cost by 25 to 30%. So it, was, it wasn't was just a minor error, it was pretty significant. But it seems to me most of the banks are on board now with uh, the correct calculation. Um, so the payback at triple P loans, we've got the forgiveness feature and then the remaining balance turns into a 1% um, a to your loan. Oh, I guess we should have updated this slide. Uh, slide here saying maximum maturity of 10 years from date of application. Sorry guys, this we we missed updating this. It's actually now a two-year loan from the application of your forgiveness, and it's a 1% interest rate. You make a note of that and fix that. Uh, loan deferments. We're still looking at uh, deferment of the entire loan amount, loan to the monthly payment for at least six months, and lender to lender could be up to a year. So loan forgiveness. Uh, what has been clarified uh, by Treasury and SBA, uh, and there's been a lot of information out there over the, uh, on the internet over the last uh, two weeks or week and a, the, the early week and a half, uh, out on the internet and from other reputable sources talking about you know this eight-week spending window. And uh, Treasury finally weighed in and basically said you have eight weeks starting with the funding of your loan, which is what we always uh, figured out was the case. Treasury has confirmed that eight weeks from the funding of your loan, uh, borrowers do not have any latitude on choosing when that eight weeks begins. They can't defer it until they, their clinics are back open. It's eight weeks that starts with the funding of your loan. Treasury also came back and weighed in on uh, the timing between the approval of your loan and the funding of the loan. It basically said that the loan has got to be funded within 10 days or no later than 10 days from the approval of your triple P loan. So there, there's a question as to whether or not that's the approval from the bank or whether that's approval from the SBA. For example, when you get your ETRAN number, uh, it's essentially been approved by the SBA. We haven't been able to clarify with any of the banks or the SBA, they haven't put out any information on which approval that 10 days is tied to. So right now, we're just assuming it's the SBA's date, which is that ETRAN date. Uh, but short story, you still have to take possession of the funds within 10 days of that original SBA date, we believe. Correct. And so for borrowers who have applied early and maybe have been a little surprised as to how fast 
the application and approval process has, has gone, uh, we're definitely encouraging you to take advantage of that 10-day lag. And your banker will tell you, you know, when that 10 days is up. I think we've seen some of those emails where the bank, banker, the banks have advised some of our clients that you have to take these funds by such and such a date, which is that 10-day window, or where the loan will go stale or, or go to the bottom of the pile. And, and quite frankly, at least the banks that we've talked to here in the last couple of days, they've been a little bit cagey, quite frankly, on their interpretation of when that 10 day starts. Um, and so I, I think it's ultimately gonna be up to the bank. If they're gonna require you to sign the documents and take funding within a specific period of time or risk it going to the bottom of the pile, I think you're simply gonna have to comply with what the bank is asking you to do. So along those lines, you know, we've gotten questions about, well, what if I've been approved by the bank and, and the bank has received that e-tran or commitment number for your loan and then you don't sign the loan document uh, and take the money within 10, 10 days. It's basically, a, I would assume, a busted loan. In other words, it goes away. And the, the question has been, well, can that borrower, can you as a practice owner reapply for a triple P loan? I was uh, reading the provisions of the actual statute, and it appears, yes, uh, the only the only borrower, one of the borrower requirements is, and it's you self-certified, is that you haven't already received a triple P loan for the the new the new quote new triple P loan you're applying for. So if you have applied for a triple P loan with your bank and the timing is messed up, you're getting your money way too early, and you just don't you want that loan to bust, can you then circle back and, and go to the bottom of the pile, as Tyler says, and and reapply? I think the answer is yes. What we don't know is whether your bank will allow you to reapply after you've gone through the process, busted the loan, and reapply with your bank. Uh, or if you'll have to go reapply with another bank. We don't know. And SBN Treasury has not weighed in on that. They have not issued any guidance in that regard. Is you know, If you kind of refuse to take your originally triple P loan, will, will they, by their, their edict, uh, uh, you know, prevent you from reapplying? Uh, the, the, this whole timing issue, you know, we've wrestled with this and we've had, you know, obviously in our prior broadcast, we've talked about the timing issue. Uh, the timing issue relative to the start of this eight week spending window. And we've had lots of conversations internally here about the spending window and how that plays into the forgiveness feature. And, you know, without your clinic being open, uh, it makes it a very challenging uh, situation to to be able to get 100% of, of your triple P loan forgiven, uh, and potentially for really early, you know for those practice owners that apply early early on that have had their money for a week or two, uh, prospects for forgiveness of a substantial part of their triple P loan it, it diminishes diminishes. Uh, every week that your opening date gets pushed out. And we're going to touch about touch on that as well, uh, about the the stated opening date of May 18th and where where it could end up. Just to just to reemphasize as well though, if if you're prepared to receive your money and perhaps you don't necessarily want it yet, it's not a it's not necessarily a foolproof plan to just deny the loan and, and allow it to go to the bottom of the pile. You still need, as, a, as an owner, you're going to have to weigh the risk on whether or not you believe that by going to the bottom of the pile, there's still going to be funds available when your application gets back up to the top. And at, you know, roughly $24, $25 billion a day going out, if Congress does not re-up the pot, 
there's a pretty substantial uh, chance that that money ultimately will be gone. So ultimately you have to make that decision on whether or not you're willing to, to take that risk and delay the funding by going to the bottom of the pile. Very important. Absolutely critical. Um, you know, and it's, it's uh, certainly stressful and, you know, a source of anxiety for all, for all you practice owners to watch what's going on back in D.C. with the uh, politics as usual uh, that we've seen back there for uh, several years now. Uh, in the arm wrestling over, you know, do we take care of Small Business America or where does the political one up, upmanship, you know, Trump taking care of uh, small business? I think it's no pun intended. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what, what, one final point here. Again, the amount of the loan forgiveness so far is still tax free. We haven't seen any further guidance on that. And everything we've been hearing from, like, our professional, our national association, the AICPA, and everything we've seen published by Treasury and SBA, is their focus for the last two weeks has been purely on the application and approval process of these loans, getting these loans out the door, getting the money out the door in the hands of business owners and uh, ultimately in the hands of employees. Which has kind of left, it, quite frankly, a void in terms of the the forgiveness component, which I think everybody, now that they've got their heads wrapped around the loan amount and what it's designed to be used for, the forgiveness feature is now kind of the, the topic of conversation. And unfortunately, because of the kind of the rollout snafus with the SBA and the Treasury, uh, they kind of viewed that forgiveness feature as a problem for eight weeks from now. And so there's just been kind of tragically very little information out there, very little guidance. Uh, but we're, we're hoping and we're expecting that that's going to be issued here in the next week or two. Uh, the AICPA, our trade organization, has been working very, very closely with the SBA and the U.S. Treasury to try and get that stuff streamlined and, and done as quickly as possible. But as of last night, um, there, there's still just very little out there about it. Yep. So the point, what you're seeing here on the slide deck, uh, point here involving, you know, a, a reduction of the calculated forgiveness based on uh, a reduced number of employees uh, during your eight-week spending window and between now and June 30. And we have an example to kind of walk through some of this, some of these scenarios, you know, opening mid-May, opening um, June 1st, opening June 15th, and, you know, to put some real-life scenarios, you know, uh, in front of you. But the, the calculation of these, you know, comparable full-time equivalent employees, both in number and pay amounts, is up in the air. Uh, as we've said in prior broadcasts, a lot of this, the CARES Act was thrown together quickly, and there's uh, provisions that, you know, one provision compared to another provision that don't seem to be, you know, congruent, that there's got to be additional guidance from uh, Treasury and SBA to figure out how, how these numbers are calculated. Uh, the key point here on this slide is the bottom one, the SBA guidance is needed to clarify how, how this will be calculated, as well as for the exemption for rehires. As we've talked about this internally, uh, and as we mentioned in prior broadcast, there's, there appeared to be what I call a you know, get out of jail free card uh, for rehiring all your employees by June 30. But as we've talked about this internally and kind of debated where this could head, head ultimately head, is in the context of the legislation. You know, Congress, the administration, Congress, uh, you know, and all the narrative behind the CARES Act has been uh, 
through the SBA, the government was going to get 100% guaranteed loans in the hands of the banks. The banks then were going to be the, the regional distributors to the business owners, and the business owners were presumed were going to turn around and rehire all their employees upon receiving the CARES Act, you know, the SBA triple P loan proceeds. And uh, in that scenario, if that, if that was the case, you know, even though the business wasn't open, that the practice owners rehired their employees and paid them to sit at home, that the loans would be forgiven. And this rehire exemption uh, states rehired by June 30. We think that's because that is the final uh, the final date triple P loans can be issued. What we speculated on is will this come back to kind of bite you in the rear and will it will ultimate guidance dictate the start of the rehire requirement with the borrower's eight-week spending window. We don't know, but if that is the case, if that turns out to be the case, then the ultimate forgivable portion of these triple P loans is going to be a fraction of what uh, we're all hoping for. So said another way, just to clarify what Brian's saying, the statute says that you have to have your employees back by June 30th, but it is entirely possible, if not likely, that the Treasury and the SBA are going to modify that date to more sync up with the eight-week period um, of, your, of your PPP loan. That being said, there's, there's some traps in there um, in terms of how the calculation, the mechanics of how that math all works that you just need to be very, very careful with and talk with your CPA to make sure you're not walking into a bear trap. Because last I last I looked, you don't want to walk into a bear trap. <laughs> Very true. Yeah, that hurts. Rather have COVID. All right. Uh, in the weeks ahead, we're going to see guidance on uh, how how borrowers will be applying for the forgiveness. We expect it to be fairly quick uh, following June 30. Uh, the uh, Treasury and SBA. And banks as well, quite frankly, because the banks are going to want their, their money back and the forgiveness portion, uh, are going to push to trigger the, the forgiveness phase of the triple P loans uh, fairly soon, after June 3rd. So in the fall, summer, late summer, fall time period. I, I think the statute actually says that you can apply for it immediately after your eight-week period. Now, whether or not the banks are going to be set up and whether or not the guidance has even been issued by then for for that calculation to be concrete, that remains to be seen. But at least the, I think the intent is that it's supposed to be a relatively quick and painless process right after you're done. Right. Hey, Tyler Jones, do you have any comments to add? Uh, you know, the only thing I would add is I agree with everything you guys have said. Um, two things is as I look at all the loan documents that my clients are showing me and having me review, I, I know one or two things one is they're super simple and, and pretty benign the only caveat i'm seeing that is worth noting is is that in almost all of them oh sorry guys can you guys hear me okay you, you broke up a little bit there oh okay well um what i'm seeing is that the Sorry, um, what I'm seeing is that the banks are saying that um, you have to affirmatively, they're gonna put a 10 day window before the end of your eight week period that you have to go to them and seek uh, your forgiveness application. They're not, they're officially saying in their documents, we're not gonna remind you to go and get your forgiveness application in, that's on you. And it's gonna be five to 10 days before the end of the eight week period. And I would expect some more SBA guidance because you know, I don't really know how you put an application in when you have 10 to five more days of time where you could be incurring payroll costs and rent expenses. So it's a little unclear what that application period looks like. I'm just telling all my clients, make sure that you dock it that day in your calendar, whatever day it is, so you make sure your application for forgiveness is in on time. 
The only other thing I, I would say is that probably in the next two weeks, I think we're gonna get formal guidance from the Treasury Department. It's pretty clear now that the two leaves that you get under the Family First Coronavirus Response Act, so the family medical leave and the emergency paid leave, those credits that we talked about, I think two webinars ago, those, you do get a credit for those on your Form 941, your quarterly employment taxes. And if you take that credit, it's gonna impact the amount of forgiveness you get on your PPP loan. Um, and we're gonna get, hopefully in the coming weeks, an exact formula on what that looks like. So one thing to keep in mind is once you're back up and open, if you're not exempting yourself out of those paid leave uh, provisions, then you need to talk to your CPA to, before you start paying out for that leave to make sure you understand how it's gonna impact your PPP loan. Um, and then kind of to dovetail off that, well, it's, um, we're just expecting more guidance, I guess is what I'd leave it at. I don't know if Brian's heard anything more than I have. I, I don't think we have, Tyler. We've been bird dogging this, you know, every day just like you have. All good points and I think the message there is th that this stuff is not, you know, simple back of the napkin calculation stuff. And um, keep changing. it keeps changing. So stay plugged into your advisors. Uh, anything more on this forgiveness? You want to you comment on this news flash that just hit? So while, while we were talking, we just received a news alert from the Wall Street Journal. It literally posted about four minutes ago. Uh, the latest numbers on the, the SBA PPP loans, 1.3 million loans were approved, and total funds right now are $289 billion out the door. Uh, and so the Wall Street Journal spoke with a spokesman uh, from the White House who expects that as soon as today, uh, funds could be gone. They also went on to indicate that uh, the Senate leaders were supposed to be meeting with the Treasury this afternoon, um, and, and we'll see where that goes. But it looks like the funds are, are getting, getting pretty low. So this is, this kind of advances the clock on what Congress is, is doing with regard to the supplemental $250 billion that they've been arm wrestling over uh, to add to the Triple P funding bucket. Uh, last we heard, and there hasn't been a lot in the press since, but last Thursday the, the $250 billion supplement kind of got derailed. Uh, both sides of the aisle arm wrestling over uh, conditions. Uh, you know, earmarking portions of that $250 billion for select groups. Uh, and then, as I'm sure you've probably seen in the press as well, the, the total relief package was about $500 billion. And so they've been arm wrestling, you know, what's the other $250 billion besides the Triple P money? Uh, and there's been comments uh, in the news about, you know, non-related COVID pet projects, or as I would call it, certain congressional members trying to hang ornaments on, on this relief bill. And so that derailed it last Thursday. But now with this latest news, obviously it, it puts uh, more than a sense of urgency back in D.C. for them to you know, move off the dime and get the, the additional uh, relief provisions passed. Uh, you know, we have no crystal ball, but from from the sources that we we follow, and in particular our national association, like Tyler said, has got a direct pipeline to the leaders at SBA, Treasury, and top uh, congressional leaders. And the the overwhelmingly strong indication is that they're going to get this uh, additional funding bill approved. But the question is, would you would you wager $349 billion on it? I, I'm not sure I would, but I think if I, if, without odds, I would definitely still take that they're going to get it done at some point, whether it's tomorrow or Friday or sometime next week. I think it still happens. Yeah. Okay, we're going to move into an example as to how the forgiveness feature of these triple P loans work. It's going to hopefully make all the the words 
come together and make some sense for you. So we've put together an example here, a simple example, um, monthly payroll of $40,000, again, so that, you know, 2.5x that number gives you a triple P loan of 100 grand, so we get some um, easy numbers to work with. Now, keep in mind, the eight-week spending window is based on weekly expenses, not monthly, so there's a little disconnect there. So in other words, you're talking about 56 days. You're not talking about two months, which could potentially be 62 days. You're, you're, you've got seven, seven days in a week, eight weeks. It's only 56 days, so you need to be careful not to fall into a two-month trap. Right. Uh, so we've converted... Uh, we've converted the $100,000 annual, you know, the cap, the annual payroll, presumably for the owners, um, and some highly paid, occasional highly paid uh, employees, uh, unlikely in a de most dental practices, to bust $100,000. So we just rounded it out to uh, weekly payroll, owner's payroll of $1,900 is the equivalent of hundred grand a year. Uh, and so forth. We got 10 employees, one owner, $100,000 uh, triple P loan. And assuming, let's say, th that particular practice got funding on this coming Monday, uh, that starts that eight week spending window uh, and it terminates June 14th. So we've, we've run a scenario here assuming uh, some business open days. So 5-4 is what Governor Inslee is currently you know, set for the opening of non-essential businesses in general. 518 for medical dental clinics. 6-1, uh, the 6-1 days, the significance there, we're gonna, we'll talk about the bit. And then the fourth date is uh, 615, and, and again, the significance there comes into play because uh, that's where Oregon's at, you know, mid-June. And so if we break this down between uh, days still closed from, from May 20th until practice is open or the business is open, and then days post opening to do kind of do the math. And we're gonna assume that you keep your employees furloughed until you actually open uh, your practice uh, for business. Uh, we can maybe talk a little bit more about why that would be down the road, but um, we are still of the opinion, and, and I think it's sound that you wouldn't want to necessarily bring people back just to pay them to sit on their thumbs because the way that this forgiveness calculation works, just remember that the federal side of the employer payroll taxes, that's that 7.65% that you as the employer pay on all of your employees' wages, that component of it is not forgivable. And so the wage part of it, the, the benefits part of it, potentially yes, but that federal payroll tax side is not. And so at the end of the day, even if you get the wages forgiven, you are still out of pocket for all of the federal tax side of it. So it does not make sense to bring them back before they're able to be productive. Correct. <clears throat> so just to translate that into a, a, a simple number example, let's say you pay an employee a thousand bucks. So you got a thousand dollars of triple P money, you turn around and pay an, an employee a thousand bucks. Uh, and so then it qualifies to be forgivable. And so a thousand bucks in, a thousand bucks out for the practice owner, you know, it's a net zero, uh, zero, except as Tyler has mentioned, the practice owner has incurred the FICA and Medicare, the employer side of FICA and Medicare tax on that thousand bucks to the tune of almost 8%. So it's actually a net out of pocket. You want to walk through the payroll cox? I'm not as familiar with them as you are. But okay. Well, up to you. Um, so, in this first example, we've got essentially you're closed for two weeks before you bring everybody back. 
In this scenario, as the owner, you would stay on your own payroll, whether you're a PLLC, S corporation, part of a partnership, doesn't really matter. Um, and then all of a sudden you bring all of your employees back, and so you've got basically six weeks worth of uh, wages included in this number. If we assume that this number comes down to here, you've got uh, bona fide payroll of 59000 you've got rent of 10000 you've got a preliminary forgiveness amount of $59,000. There's some calculations and there's some mechanics of what percent can be rent and non-payroll costs. That's going to be limited to 25% of, of the overall PPP forgiveness amount. And so there's some additional math ultimately that has to get done in order to make sure that you're not over those different limitations. So um, in this particular scenario, uh, it looks like there's not a, there is no limitation uh, in this scenario, but we will we'll get into it down here, down so the road. So how that $78,000 number is calculated, it's basically taking the preliminary payroll, that $59,000 number, and dividing that by 0.75. So your overall your overall potential forgivable amount is seventy eight thousand seven hundred seventy five percent of that would be fifty nine thousand dollars of payroll and give you the twenty five percent bucket for non payroll being nineteen seven but the amount of forgiveness is the lower of those two numbers sixty nine thousand versus seventy eight thousand so keep in mind that the the first step in all of this of potentially getting any of the of the forgiveness means that the money actually still has to be spent. So if it doesn't get spent on payroll and it doesn't get spent on rent, there's zero chance that the money gets forgiven. Potentially converts to a loan on the back side, but the first step in all of this is still going to actually be spending the money. So even well, though before you go to the next example, the, the point on spending the money, remember these loans, the loan proceeds have a very specific qualified use. So your triple P uh, loan funds still have to be spent on payroll, your, your rent and utilities, and interest. certain interest <clears throat> um, on, on qualifying debt. Now, the way we interpret that is it doesn't all have to be spent in that eight-week window. So if you don't spend all your triple P money in that eight-week window, window it, it's still available to you to spend on those qualified uses outside the eight-week window. It just wouldn't be forgiven. Correct. So in this initial example where you're closed for two weeks and then you're open the remaining six weeks, remember that you applied for and were granted a $100,000 loan, and yet because you were essentially closed for two weeks, uh, before you were able to get back to work, your forgiveness amount actually goes down because, again, you, could, you essentially couldn't spend all of the money in time. So you're, you're, you're still forgiven $69,000, uh, but a far cry from the hundred grand that we yeah. all hoped. It's still a good day. Still a good day. We move on to the next example. So this 518 date, that's the earliest that we believe any of the practices could potentially be open. Uh, and assuming you get your money next Monday, you're looking at exactly four weeks from that day until you can open, and then you would be open for four day or four weeks, excuse me, uh, after that. And so you can see how the math on this changes relatively quickly, um, and your your forgiveness amount ultimately just continues to go down because again, you haven't been able to spend all of the money on those uh, those qualified expenses. Where it starts to get um, where it starts to get ugly is down here, where the, the the open date gets pushed out further and further. And I'm not sure we'll necessarily spend too much time on our personal beliefs of that, but I I think it's certainly within the realm of possibility that that May 18th is not is not the day. I think I think so. Yeah. So, I, I mean, even if it got pushed, pushed to June 1st, where 
your your closed six weeks open two, so your your payroll spend is down substantially, but you know you would continue to to pay your owner pay. Um, you know, a, a almost forty thousand dollar forgiveness is is still a good day. I mean, I would still take that. Um, you know, does that line up with kind of what we thought the CARES Act, you know, and these triple P loans were, were all about? Not necessarily. Uh, it seems to be the winners uh, with triple P loans are those businesses that have been able to stay open and keep working uh, versus businesses that, that were shut down. And so it's, you know, all those businesses that have been classified as essential businesses. And so there's, there's certainly, a, I think, a, a disconnect between at least what we thought early on was the congressional intent of these triple B loans. Um, in the case, well, one more thing to clarify as well. We are assuming with this calculation, and we should make this very, very clear, that there is no further reduction based on a reduction in headcount. So in this calculation, we are assuming that all of your employees are back on the payroll by that magic date of June 30th. It would require a, a massive spreadsheet, quite frankly, to go through the reduction calculation in the event that that's not true. So um, we, we just assumed that practices would be back open and everybody would be back on payroll by June 30th for purposes of showing this example, but that, that, that might not be the case. So that's yeah, an important so, caveat. So that goes back to, you know, the, the earlier points on the maintaining the same FTE equivalents and the same payroll equivalent. And we don't know where that's going to end up. We know what the statute says. And like Tyler says that this example is based on what the statute says, but if SBA, comes back and with their own interpretation and basically forces uh, business owners to run those FTE and pay payroll uh, reduction numbers based on your eight week spending window, these loan forgiveness amounts will dive you know significantly they'll be reduced significantly it, it especially right here where let's say the the reopening date is pushed out to June or heaven forbid even June 15th. In the event that that happens and you did not bring back your employees, because again, we don't think it makes sense to if, if the practices are not open, the, these limits are gonna be essentially 10% of this. So you'd, you'd be looking at a $2,000 um, forgiveness. For, forgiveness amount as opposed to $20,000. So the still much to, much to be figured out with when that calculation has to occur, uh, but, but hopefully there's going to be guidance coming on that relatively soon. It, it's a lot, I mean, as we mentioned earlier, though, this is potentially a, a giant bear trap for the unwary. Yep. Okay, so that is the example of how we think the trip P forgiveness is going to work at this point. Uh, regulatory guidance, as we indicated before, has been on getting these loans out, and we've got to wait for guidance on uh, the whole forgiveness side of this triple P deal. Unemployment benefits. Uh, we have uh, continued to get many, many emails and phone calls regarding unemployment benefits. And so we, we put a lot of the information in this slide deck so that you can refer to it later. But so we'll talk about employees first and then we'll talk about practice owners and, and self-employed folks. But for uh, employees, so the, as we said in our last broadcast, the unemployment rules have been, uh, you know, significantly uh, lightened up. So uh, most people who otherwise may not have qualified, most employees who would not have qualified for unemployment benefits do now. They, they eliminated the, that minimum 
uh, hours, you know, 680 hours that you had to have worked in your base year. Uh, they've eliminated the one-week one waiting period and so forth. And so e Employment Security, EFD, has basically said uh, if you go to their website, you'd find a lot of this information. For those employees that would not otherwise qualify for unemployment benefits, file, go online and file. You're going to get a denial of benefits notification. Don't freak out over it. The, the uh, denial is based on their standard computer system, which does not reflect the emergency rules. ESD has been working hard to update their computer system to reflect the emergency rules in the CARES Act rules. And until they have that dialed in, employees, some employees are going to get a denial of benefits claim. And, and obviously that's going to freak them out. They're going to worry, like, now how am I going to, you know, even get a little bit of money to, to get by while they're on standby unemployment. Um, once ESD has their system up and running, they're going to go back and hand process all these uh, denial of benefit claims, um, get them approved, and pay benefits retroactively. So for those employees, unfortunately, it's a, it's a cash flow challenge. You know, they're probably living off their credit cards. ESD has also asked for employees and employers not to call their claim center with respect to these denial of benefits uh, messages because it's just clogging up their system. And I think I've, I've heard some folks trying to call ES, the claim center and they just get a busy signal. So as of last night, um, the latest guidance from the ESD, which I it would encourage you to sign up for their email alerts. They send a, an update about every other day uh, on kind of where they are in the process. But as of last night, um, they're indicating that by the 17th, they could potentially be up for these expanded benefits. Want to cover practice owners? So for, if I had a dollar for every time I received a phone call or, or email about uh, whether or not an, an owner of a practice qualifies, I'd, I'd have enough to buy a case of beer. But the, the reality is that under the CARES Act now, you, you as, a, as an owner, qualify. Again, what we just said, it's similar with uh, the employees that haven't met the, the hours requirement. You're going to get a denial of, of, of benefit if you uh, try to apply right now. And so specifically for business owners, if you go to the ESD website for the state of Washington, they are encouraging you to wait to apply as a business owner until the, the, the improvements to the website are up and running. But again, if you sign up for that email alert, you will be notified the moment that it is finished and, and you're able to submit your application. The other thing that I should mention is that even though you might not be able to apply until this Friday or even potentially next week if, if it gets delayed further, they are still going to backdate your benefit check to the date that you were essentially forced to close, or at least through the effective date of the law, which I think is what, March 27th? So uh, dental offices, I believe, were closed March 18th. And the, so between March 18th and March 27th, when the CARES Act was passed, it would be just state level unemployment benefits. And Which for, uh, for you as an owner would, would be zero. But once the CARES Act becomes effective, then, then it's, a business owner is allowed. Yeah, it's, so, it's, so the state level benefits are retro to probably March 18th when they closed. And the $600 federal supplement starts March 27th. So it would be, uh, the w that was a Friday, so it would be that, that week uh, would be the first week that $600 supplement would kick in. Now, based on some of the correspondence we've been getting from clients regarding their own filing for unemployment, uh, somehow they're getting into the ESD system. We suspect because they filled out their unemployment claim incorrectly because uh, the correspondence that's coming back is almost like ESD wants to confirm them as a regular employee versus 
uh, an owner employee, which typically have, are exempt from paying state unemployment taxes, and so they're outside the state unemployment system. And so just please, like Tyler says, wait, wait until the system is up and can accept your applications as a, a business owner or self-employed individual. The idle grants. Um, you want to cover that? Sure. So it's been a couple of weeks since we've really touched on these. Um, we're actually starting to see some of these get funded now for some of our clients. The, the way that it was originally worded, we were kind of under the impression that everybody who applied that qualified was going to get essentially a $10,000 advance. Um, unbeknownst to anybody, the, the SBA and the Treasury kind of just changed their minds ultimately on the calculation of, of how they were going to decide who got money. And they just decided that instead of $10,000 flat per business, they were saying $1,000 per employee up to $10,000 based on the number of jobs claimed on your uh, idle grant application. So nowhere does it say that that's how it was supposed to work, but that's uh, ultimately what the SBA decided. Yeah, and they're, they're sending uh, email, email messages to businesses that filed for the idle grant, basically saying, hey, you know, we've, we've received your application, approved it, and explain what Tyler says, you, you're getting $1,000 per, per uh, employer. Actually, on the, I believe on the idle grant, it said how many jobs um, does your business have? Uh, unfortunately, if if a practice owner filed that idle grant and put four jobs, for example, and did not include themselves, which would have made five, uh, they got shorted a thousand bucks. You know, so basically they got four grand instead of five grand. Uh, I've yet to see where. Uh, you know, a lot of the, the separate, the side real estate entities we talked about in a previous broadcast uh, where a uh, real estate entity was leasing to the practice entity and those real estate entities had filed for their own $10,000 idle grant because those entities have their own employees, we're suspecting that they're going to get zero idle grant money. Uh, that's just the way it turned out. Uh, this is just a reminder of extended tax deadlines uh, because we continue to get phone calls and emails from clients saying, hey, just want to make sure you filed my April 15th extension. Uh, and we've said this many times. Uh, all individuals, in, in, including trust entities, have an automatic extension to file their return and pay their balance of their 2019 taxes until July 15th. No extension forms are required. No action is required by you, by you the taxpayer, or by your CPAs. Zero, okay? So nothing. Uh, all tax payments uh, due April 15th, which includes your 2020 Q1 estimated tax payment. Uh, are due April 15th. It's been pushed to July 15th. Since our last broadcast, we also got word that the 2020 Q2 estimated tax payment, normally due on June 15th, also got pushed to July. Uh, there are some other April 15th deadlines that got pushed, namely your IRA contributions, your HS HSA contributions, all got pushed to July. 15th. Uh, we continue to monitor uh, the county and city and, and state other tax agencies like Department of Revenue, uh, I believe both for SUDA and LNI. So payroll taxes, BNO taxes and payroll, ta payroll taxes for the most part uh, have deferral options. Just go to those sources to find out what they are. We know real estate tax payments have been extended out till I believe June 1, so the April payment has been June 1. Yeah, the only caveat there is that it's a county by county determination. Um, as far as we know, well, we know King County for sure. 
Uh, we didn't go through and look up all other 40-something counties in the state, but it is a county-by-county county determination, that, and they ultimately have that authority. Okay. So for business owners, we have some additional uh, payment deferral options. Uh, one that's pretty sizable is the employer's side of FICA Medicare taxes on payrolls through the end of this year are, are available to be deferred, interest-free and penalty-free. Uh, that could be a pretty sizable number. So, you know, building into your, your cash flow model, uh, this is just another place to squeeze a little cash out of the equation. Where, where this could potentially come back and bite you, though, is that if you have a PPP loan that is forgiven, you are then no longer allowed to defer those taxes. So, for example, if you've been deferring those taxes even during that eight-week period um, and then you decide to apply for forgiveness immediately following that, your ability to then defer those taxes later is it goes away. You can't do you can't do both. Okay, so say it another way. So starting today, let's say you defer your employer fight to Medicare, you get your PPP loan, you get through your eight week spending, you get a couple months down the road, you're back open, and let's say in August you are applying for the forgivable portion of your PPP loan. What Tyler's saying is at the time your PPP forgiveness happens, you can no longer defer additional payroll taxes, you know, from August through the end of the year. You're not required to go back and, and then immediately pay the, the payroll taxes that you deferred for that eight-week period, but you can do no additional payroll taxes right. after the point in time in which your, your loan is deemed to have been forgiven. Right. Right, so it's between now and that forgiveness date. Uh, the payback is pretty generous. It's half has got to be paid back by December 31, 2021, so next year, and the other half to the following year. Uh, state, city, and county level taxes have generally been deferred, as I mentioned. B&O taxes, both state and many of the cities have uh, you know, allowed a deferral mechanism and a deferral of a, a payment, and each has their own kind of payback kind of structure. Uh, they're not forgiving them completely, it's just a deferral. Uh, I assume, we assume, but we were looking to confirm it this morning, the personal property taxes, you know, so the personal property taxes that businesses pay on their, on their equipment, their desks, their computers, uh, normally, there's a payment due in April. It got deferred. It got deferred, so we confirmed it was deferred. But interestingly, the the personal property tax affidavit forms, which are due in April, at least as of yesterday, had not been deferred or extended. So unless that's changed today, which is kind of weird, if they deferred the payment, why wouldn't they defer the filing of uh, the current year tax form? Any any comment to add, Tyler Jones? No, you guys covered it all. I'm, I'm the quiet one today. Okay. Okay, some miscellaneous stuff uh, that you know we hadn't covered in previous broadcast. Again, uh, another another source of potential cash. You want to cover this one? Sure. So I think the. The disclaimer here is that this should kind of be treated with a little bit of grain of salt and ultimately as a, as a very last resort, but under the CARES Act, there are some rather, um, I guess, gentle rules when it comes to taking early distributions out of a retirement account in the event that you would need it and you are either um, diagnosed with COVID and or a direct family member ultimately comes down with it. Um, you could potentially be allowed to take up to $100,000 out, out of a 401k or an IRA, um, even if you're under the age of 59 and a half, essentially penalty-free. Uh, and then you've got 
basically three years in order to repay those distribution amounts to avoid the taxation of that. Um, again, I, I, would, I would hope that this is going to have limited applicability. Uh, I kind of view this as a very last resort uh, in terms of finding cash. But in the event that, uh, that you absolutely have to, there is some relief uh, afforded you under the CARES Act. Well, and one of the, the qualifying triggers to be able to pull that 100 grand out of retirement plan or IRA is if your place of business is closed, um, you know, due to COVID. And under the governor's mandate, we certainly uh, check that box. Uh, like Tyler says, retirement monies, it's so hard to, you know, save retirement monies to pull them out of those retirement funds. Um, it is just going to be difficult to get them put back in those retirement funds. So as a kind of last ditch, last bucket of money to, to go tap into. If you need to and you end up pulling that money out, you know, fine. Uh, you know, it's the path to survival. You uh, have the option to spread the taxation of that hundred grand over three years and or uh, the ability to pay part or all of it back within three years. Status of uh, add-on relief legislation. This is, this is where we sit around the table and scare into our crystal balls and kind of debate what the heck's going on and what we think is going to go on. Uh, we're still of the mind uh, more likely than not that we're going to get additional funding for triple P loans. We could be completely wrong on that, uh, but that's kind of where we see it. The, the whole narrative back in D.C. from day one uh, of this coronavirus uh, disaster that, that, you know, on one hand, you know, the pandemic and the physical loss, the, the human loss, but the, the financial impact on our economy, the world economy, uh, and I keep keep hearing the echo of uh, that saying, you know, the, the cure can't be worse than the cause. And we talk about this every day about the the risk of, of small business America uh, not being able to come back from these business closures. And certainly, the more they extend uh, these business closures, the harder and tougher it's going to be for some of some small businesses, especially those that were on uh, you know very thin financial footing, you know didn't have three to six months of working capital stuffed away uh, for the rainy day, or uh, you know our new practice owners that just bought a practice within the last uh, six months, six months to a year, and, and have a, a mountain of debt that you you've got to you know, service um, and, and get back to work. So with, with the backdrop of that and the administration and Congress's kind of at least vocalized intent that they want to save small business, we think that they're, they're going to open their wallets and keep throwing money at it. Uh, that's, that's at least our speculation at this point. Uh, I think given the the latest news on how fast the remaining $349 billion uh, is, is kind of getting approved in loans and, and coming down to the last buck in that bucket, it's going to put pressure on Congress to act. And I think we're going to see, uh, see stuff in the news come out today, tomorrow. And I wouldn't be surprised if we had uh, uh, this relief legislation passed by the end of the week. At least that's my take. Do you have anything to add to that? I, I think given the over, overwhelming popularity of the PPP, given that it's kind of the first thing of its kind that's directly aimed at small business as opposed to, you know, massive corporate America, I think it, it, it's got a positive narrative and it's been so popular and, and businesses have flooded to it. I think it's a relatively easy win for Congress to, to get something done, um, whether it's going to be today, tomorrow, or, or a week from now, and whether or not it'll even be called the PPP. They might, you know, they might very well change some of the parameters. They might expand parameters, change some of the terms. Um, but I think ultimately, given the, the state of where we are 
and potentially where we could be headed, that obviously more money is going to be needed. And I think Congress, both sides, um, you know, left and right, have, have acknowledged that there is an issue and are willing to open up the wallets to kind of do what it takes to, uh, to stem off the tide, uh, at, 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 least, at least through the election. <laughs> yeah. So some, uh, some in interesting stats on the, uh, the PPP loans that have been approved and funded. And I'm, I'm working off of the uh, $248 billion number that was last reported yesterday. Washington State uh, approved dollars were just under $5 billion out of that $248 billion. Uh, states like Texas and California were around $20, $21 billion. And then the other interesting stat that I find is the percent of triple P loans for health care. Uh, because across the whole country, we've got medical dental offices have been shut down for non-emergent care, yet only 11% of the approved triple P loans have been for health care businesses. I just find that a bit interesting. Uh, Tyler Jones, any commentary? Uh, the only thing I would say that I think we're still missing is we're, we're waiting for guidance and we haven't gotten it. And, Hopefully it comes out about what's going to happen to employers' experience ratings for unemployment purposes. Employment security, I think, has been buried as they kind of build up being a conduit for the self-employed and business owner unemployment portions that are going to start coming out hopefully in the next few days. So we still haven't received any guidance. Um, I wrote a letter and have some calls out to a senator's office about it, a state senator. So. Um, hopefully we'll hear something uh, to tell us what's going to happen to employer experience ratings for purposes of unemployment in the post-COVID-19 world. I don't know if Brian or Tyler often heard anything. We, we have not, but that's, that's a good point. Uh, you know, as I've said, said it before, uh, the powers to be are making the plane as they are flying it. Okay, let's talk about when will business reopen again. It, you know, this is a topic of concern, certainly in our office. We talk about it every day. We keep eyeballs on uh, Governor Inslee's uh, press conferences, as well as the press conferences uh, coming out of D.C. Um, so we've got we've got the the, the politicians and the business owner bias politicians, and then we have the medical uh, folks like Dr. Fauci, Fauci and the um, head doctor here in, in the Department of Health, Washington State Department of Health. I don't remember his name. But the, the, the doctors are all kind of saying, hey, we've got to push this opening date. You know, and I get that purely from a, a medical point of view. You know, they're ignoring all the rest of the collateral damage, you know, financial and small business-wise and so forth. They're, they're kind of pushing this message of um, uh, we need to stay, stay closed and follow the social distancing for uh, a period longer than certainly May 4th. So, you know, if, if we were kind of betting on that, uh, I would, I would probably bet uh, June 1st is. I wouldn't be surprised if the governor came down and pushed the date to June 1st. Uh, the the other indication is that I'm sure you've all heard Washington, Washington, Oregon, and California have formed a. The governors have formed kind of a coalition of, uh, hey, we're going to open up the West Coast uh, uniformly. And the troubling part of that is, you know, Oregon has already shut dental down until May 18th. That's June 15th. Or Ju June 15th, sorry. Um, and if Oregon has a, a voice in this, uh, when we get to open up again and influences California and Washington, uh, that's just brutal. You know, what's that, a 90 day closure? So there, there is a press conference. Governor Inslee is scheduled to have 
a, uh, a speech today at 3 p.m., the topic of which is their plan for reopening. So I think today, if there was ever a day to watch the news um, specific to your practice, today would probably be that day. And, and hopefully we get some additional clarification on um, hurdles that they need to see gotten over and some additional concrete steps that they're taking to get this open. But I, I, I agree with Brian, if I had to bet, I, I don't think May 18th is going to be it. I just don't. You know, so the, the, the business owner side of me, the, that bias is what is the WDA, the uh, CDA, the, the Oregon Dental Association, what are these business groups who are looking out for the interest of practice owners as, you know, from the business owner's point of view? What are they doing to lobby to weigh in some balance here? Because what good is it to shut these businesses down clear into June and lose 20, 25% of them? Because they just can't survive through the, the financial crisis side of this. Uh, to me, that just strikes me as, as not a winning proposition. And so I, I would be one to vote for the uh, our organizations in, in, in dental, that'd be WDA, AGD, all the way down, you know, to start lobbying for the sensible solution. When can we get back open for business? What, where's that balance? What can dental do to make their clinic safe? I've been hearing from our uh, from our clinic owners, our practice owners. They've been investing in the basically surgical air filtration systems. Uh, they've been trying to order face masks, uh, higher level um, higher level uh, filtration, you know, so face shields and, and, and face masks. Uh, they've been trying to order equipment, apparently, the uh, uh, mirrors with uh, suction devices that reduce the amount of aerosols. At, at what point does that come into the conversation and say, hey, uh, Washington State Department of Health and the politicians, here's what we're doing as an industry to make our clinics safer so that we can get back in business sooner. And, and I think that part of the conversation maybe. Uh, it needs to, that volume needs to be turned up some. At least that's that's from my point of view as a as a business owner and representing business owners. Tyler, any comment? No. The only thing I would I would say is I, I'm really hopeful that Governor Inslee today gives us some substance to a plan. Uh, Gavin Newsom in California had his talk this morning, and I watched it, and it it was. Uh, his plan apparently is to get a plan in place. So it was a hour long press conference. <laughs> his plan is to get a plan, oh, which, I, which I don't disagree with. He should have a plan to get a plan. But um, you know, hopefully if we're all acting in concert with Oregon and California, uh, Governor Inslee will have a little bit more substance today. All right, guys, so, are you ready we... to answer some questions? Sure. Um, we've got a lot of questions and please uh, understand we're not going to get to all these questions. Some of you that have written uh, paragraph long questions, we just quite simply can't do it. Gentlemen, please feel free to let these uh, answer these questions with uh, uh, that's something for your CPA or attorney. Uh, we, we're not trying to put you on the spot here. No problem. Okay, I have an S corporation working as an associate, being approved only for $1,000 idle, like most of my colleagues. Am I going to get the rest of the 10K or should I apply for PPP? Uh, no, you're not likely gonna get the rest of the 10K. As we said, a business has got $1,000 per employee, uh, but that, that associate who has set themselves up uh, with an S corp and our and that S corp is paid as a 1099 independent contractor. That S corp does qualify to file for a triple PMO. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, what is one of the
correct ways to do calculation of payroll costs. And I think the doctor here is uh, looking for whether they are calculated in with those payroll costs. I think that's when you need to huddle with your uh, CPA, your own kind of math wizard. Okay. There has been some additional clarification on what is included and, and owner wages and owner compensation definitely is included in that. Um, there, it's, it's a little technical on how you get there. It's probably a better question for the CPA, but the short answer is their own wages are allowed. You know, un unfortunately, we've seen a number of, of uh, docs run those calculations uh, themselves and uh, underestimated the number, undershot the number, which, you know, ultimately, you know, hurts them and their, what, what would be available to be forgiven. So it's, not necessarily uh, hasn't been necessarily a straightforward simple calculation and and I'm not saying that just because we need more work because we definitely don't uh, but it is something you probably need to huddle with your CPA with the only thing I would add to that is that a lot of the banks especially some of the non-national ones they're like two or three weeks back on the guidance so when they're getting PPP applications with owner draws or owner comp in them they're pushing back on that saying it won't be allowed. If you go to the SBA website, there's a really great FAQ that basically says that owner comp is allowed. So if you do submit your application for, and you have owner comp in there uh, and your bank box at it, uh, point them to that FAQ. And I've seen that kind of get over the hurdle with some of the uh, uh, banks who are maybe 10 days behind the regulatory guidance. Does the does the paycheck uh, protection program include 1099 employees into consideration? If so, what documentation is required? The, the answer to that is no. Uh, each individual independent contractor would need to apply for their own PPP loan. So if a practice does not have W-2 employees and instead uses 1099s to pay uh, their workers, that it's that's ultimately going to come back to buy them. In other words, a, a borrower or practice owner's PPP application is based strictly on their W-2 payrolls. Thank you for that clarification. Um, let's see. If things are slow and I can't max out the payroll, can I give my employees bonuses so that my rent plus utilities don't exceed the 25% limit? Well, so there's, there isn't an, enough guidance, I think, to definitively say that one way or the other. Uh, there's been some, at least some um, opinions out there from different CPAs that kind of indicate that they are going to try and right size payroll. In other words, you won't be able to pay Christmas bonuses early or, or something like that. There's nothing in the statute that says you can't do that. It's still going to be limited on an annual basis to 100 grand uh, per employee. So there's there's nothing that specifically prohibits it, but we're thinking there's going to be some sort of guidance out that is probably going to curtail a, a lot of the games that could be played. So so to say it another way, if a practice owner has unspent money, let's say it's uh, thirty thousand dollars. And, you know, that $30,000 otherwise would not be forgiven. So they say, hey, well, if I pay my employees that $30,000, if I give it to them, it's like, quote, free money because I'm going to get it forgiven from the government. Can they do that? We don't know yet. Okay. That, that, that strikes me as, as gaming the system. And like Tyler indicated, I think we're going to see further guidance from Treasury and SBA on all those, uh, hopefully, all those kind of questions. All right. We are a husband and wife dentist that practice together under one FEIN number as a sole proprietor. We have separate Schedule Cs. So for the PPP loan, can we request to borrow up to $100,000 each as shown on our Schedule C? I, I think the answer is yes, you would have to apply and have two separate PPP loans. And assuming income on each of those is over $100,000, yes, you could add uh, $100,000 of owner compensation to that calculation. 
plus employee comp W-2 compensation. Correct. Right. Into the calculation. It's it's not a PPP loan up to a hundred grand. It's the equivalent of two and a half months of that hundred thousand dollar number. It's factored into your triple P loan amount. Okay. Does eight weeks begin the day the loan was dispersed? Yes. yes. Okay. All at once? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, let's see. Uh, uh, I'm not sure if this has been addressed, but has the uh, is the idle also tax free? The, we think so. The the ten thousand dollar advance, we believe is ten, is is tax free. If they go on and get an actual idle loan, that's just a normal loan. Have you seen affirmative that the grant is tax free? I believe so. Okay. All right. It does not have to be repaid. No. It doesn't have to be repaid, but but it, it also it comes off of the the forgiveness amount um, for the PPP loan. So I I think by definition it would then be tax free. Okay. Tax free, but do you think we're too late to apply for the PPP? I would say no. I think you still want to get in line, um, and certainly if Congress adds more money to it the you know, yeah the best time to apply for it was probably three days ago and today but certainly not tomorrow <laughs> can funds be used ret retroactively to pay ourselves since we skipped putting ourselves on payroll last month all at once no oh, negative nope. Uh, is it known how much we can pay ourselves the doctor and payroll during the eight weeks? Is there a cap such as a hundred thousand divided by twelve times two? Yes, the cap's a hundred grand the annual compensation amount. It's factored into what's eight weeks of that hundred grand. Would it, do we have a number of what that works out to be? No, 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 that's on a monthly. It's it was in our example. It's uh, was it nineteen hundred dollars a week? Something like that. It's fifteen thousand something. It's like fifteen thousand two hundred ish. Okay. And the way to get there would be to take a hundred thousand, divide it by fifty two weeks, then times eight weeks. It gets you the math. Uh, and just a reminder to everybody that's on this webinar, this webinar is being recorded and it will go up on YouTube here probably within the next four or five hours. So if you miss something. Uh, a lot of these questions have already been answered during the presentation. Uh, you'll be able to skim through that quickly on YouTube. And okay, we'll send how, the presentation link again, like last time. Thank you very much. How are full-time employees calculated if employees work less than 40 hours per week? We don't know yet. Okay. All righty. Uh, how do you show proof for the monthly owner's draw? Um, I'm, I'm not sure that that is going to be definitively uh, have guidance on that yet. Uh, last night, actually, after we had left for the day, the Treasury did post some additional guidance on how a Schedule C or a sole proprietor on how the loan calculation would work. Um, and it's it's consistent with our thinking, but basically it, we believe it's going to be the equivalent of your, your Schedule C net income on an annual basis. So you would basically take whatever your net income is for the year, divide it by 52, multiply it by eight, and that would give you the forgivable portion of the draws out of a Schedule C that you pay to yourself. There's some that was that was literally just issued last night, and so we haven't had enough time to work through a few examples. But it, it's if if the practice loses money, it's it's not intended to be a windfall, and so there's going to be some limitations on the amounts that get forgiven for the owner draw side of it if the practice is not profitable. Which just. Hearing you say that it's going to delay the the, the
calculation of the forgivable amount until the year is closed and you have that Schedule C information. It would appear so. Yeah. Uh, I, so this reminded me of another point. We've been hearing some banks recommending practice owners or borrowers to set up a separate bank account for the triple P money so that they can track the actual spending of that money. It's not uh, specifically required in the statute. And just from a practical uh, practical side is a lot of practices have payrolls set up through payroll service companies and then have automatic you know, payments out of their existing bank accounts. So to reconnect payroll to a new bank account is just functionally a headache. And then what, when the eight-week spend window is done or when the money's spent, reconnect it back to your original bank account and make that extra superfluous bank account go away. It, it's not a requirement, but some banks are pushing it. All righty. Uh, there is a good portion of my staff that made more money on unemployment than that they were getting paid. In our pay rate calculation for dispersing paychecks, we gave everyone a little more than they were making on unemployment, including the weekly $600. However, the hygienists will not be compensated according to their hourly rate. All were happy with this arrangement. Does this arrangement affect my loan forgiveness? I'm, I'm not sure I understand the question. I'm not Is, sure I do either. So are they, are they saying that once they got their triple P loan money that they brought people back on payroll and paid them slightly more than what they were getting on unemployment? That's what That's it looks like. kind of what it sounds like. Yeah. And so, so ultimately what impacts the for, forgivable calculation is the actual dollars, payroll dollars you pay out during that eight week period. So, um, and if they're paying, you know, again, we have those, those two prong tests. Do you have less full time equivalents uh, that potentially kick in to reduce your forgivable portion? And then the other prong of that test is the uh, wages paid, or we think it's going to be translated into wage rates, uh, are they lower by, what is it, 25%? Are they 25% or more lower than, than pre-COVID pay rates that potentially would factor into reducing the forgivable amount? So I guess in general, uh, the answer is yes. What, what they're doing with payroll potentially does impact uh, the calculation of their forgivable loan amount. If I've deferred rent payments until September, then can I still use rent as part of the forgiveness? Landlord basically deferred rent and amortized it with interest. The statute uh, with regard to the eight week spending window specifically says cost incurred and paid during that eight week window. So if you have deferred rent and don't actually pay it in that eight week window, uh, it will not factor into the forgiven loan. At least that's, that's based on the statute and what we know today, uh, but we're expecting further, further guidance. Okay. Um, here's, remind me why if the open date is four weeks after I receive funding, why can't we do the following? Number one, pay the owner and wife, slash manager to pay fixed expenses, rent utilities. You, you absolutely can do that. And, and it's advisable that you would do that. Uh, it impacts the forgivable uh, loan, the, the forgivable calculation. But you, you absolutely would. As soon as you get your triple P money, you would pay yourself, and if your wife is on the payroll, if the spouse is on the payroll, you would pay them as well, and you would pay those other qualifying expenses. And then once, say, four weeks out, the business is uh, allowed to open again, you bring the rest of your employees on, and you obviously pay them. Uh, we, we showed that in the example. Just work through the example. Uh, another comment on this eight-week spending window. Keep in mind that 
in order to satisfy that paid requirement, uh, business owners are likely going to have to run an, what's called an off-cycle payroll to capture that payroll running into the very last days of the eight-week period. What if you hire additional employees? Would that qualify for forgivable payroll? Yes. I, I believe so. The, uh, the way that the calculation works is let's say somebody leaves for an unrelated COVID reason, um, you could certainly replace that person um, and, and those qualifying payroll costs should qualify. Yeah, there's no prohibition against increasing the number of your employees and increasing your payroll. And again, it's payroll in that eight week period. So I, I think the answer is absolutely yes. I think so. What happens if employees come and work for a few hours a week for unemployment benefits? 75% uh, of what they make in that week will reduce their state level unemployment benefits. So if their state level un unemployment benefits are 400 bucks and 75% of what they made that week is $100, their state level benefits will be reduced to 300 bucks and then they'll get the additional $600 federal supplement on top of that. A uh, lot of questions about uh, applying for unemployment if they've already been denied and, and I think you've answered this, they, they need to reapply when the website is up and running again. Is that correct? Absolutely. And when, yes. when Kevin gets the slide deck sent out, we intentionally put the details of all that in those unemployment slides. Just review those slides. As Tyler here indicated, sign up for the uh, email alerts for when their system is up and reflecting the emergency rules. And um, yeah, practice owners, quit hurting yourself with the employees nagging questions about, hey, I got denied benefits, what do I do? And then everybody goes and tries to call the claim center and sits, sits online for two, three, four hours or gets a busy signal. Okay. Are dental clinics operating within Washington Technical and Community College that routinely see low income and DSHS patients eligible for some kind of grant? Um, I, I'm not sure what's the question. If I, they work for like a community health clinic or something like that or a tribal clinic, do they get any kind of special extra grant? I'm, I'm not aware of any, Tyler Jones. Uh, non it, it would depend on how the clinic is set up and how it got its tax exemption, but nonprofits are specifically mentioned as eligible for PPP. And if you are an employee of it and you were laid off, you, you could go through the usual unemployment channels. I, I'm not aware of anything specific to nonprofits that would have a limiting effect on their ability to get funds. Okay. Uh, and uh, same here. I, I haven't seen anything, but I, and I haven't seen where they qualify for anything extra either. Do Washingtonians qualify for the weekly $600 federal unemployment benefits? If yes, how and where do we apply for it? Well, it depends if you live on the west side or east side of the state. <laughs> of, co of course, of course, Washingtonians qualify for the 600 bucks. Now keep in mind, like we've said, the CARES Act special unemployment provisions have not been built into the ESD computer system yet. So be patient. They've told us, they've broadcast, wait till the 18th to apply. Uh, and once the system reflects the emergency rules, those, those $600 supplemental benefits will be paid retro active back to when an employee or a practice owner qualified for that. Okay. Okay. I just want to clarify again that the business, personal, and property taxes are not deferred and still due on 4-30-2020, right? Huh? Yeah. I don't... Re re say, say, say that again, Dr. S. The person, I just want to clarify again that the business, personal,
personal and property taxes are not deferred and still due on 4-30-2020. Is that correct? Real estate taxes in King County and many of the counties in the state have deferred the real estate tax payments until June 1st. I uh, believe that's also the case for the personal property taxes. B&O taxes uh, have been deferred and the deferral schedules are different depending on if you're a monthly filer or a quarterly filer. So they just need to go to those specific sources, go to DOR website or the county website and look at the specifics with regard to the payment deferrals. Uh, getting lots of thank yous here to you guys. Really appreciate it. So that's nice to hear. Um, I worked in 2019 about 50% W-2 and 50% 1099. How many in which programs apply? I, I think it would matter whether or not they are still a W-2 employee or whether they are still a W-2 employee and an independent contractor. If, they, if there's still an independent contractor component to it, they would theoretically uh, uh, qualify for a PPP loan, I think. And well, I looked into it earlier this week and that was my conclusion as well. But if, but if you, you know, left your independent contractor status behind January 1st and you've been W-2 for the last three and a half, four months, it, you know, you're probably overextending yourself to say that you should be able to get both. Hey, do you re recommend applying for PPP with multiple banks to see who can get it done faster? Or are you stuck with whichever one you complete in an application at first, no matter how long they take? Well, this, this question came up in our shop uh, yesterday and we kicked it around. So we went and actually looked at the statute itself. And the statute basically says uh, a borrower self-certifies and qualifies for a PPP loan as long as they have not received another PPP loan for the, for the same funds, the same, you know, uh, funding period here. And so, uh, again, it goes back to our conversation about if you let, a, let an approved triple P loan go stale with one bank, can you go to another bank and apply? And we think the answer is yes. Uh, so if we kind of extend that thinking, if you apply to multiple banks and one gets it done quick and you accept it, then I think simply you just have to either uh, kill the other applications uh, or, you know, withdraw them basically. And I think you're still going to be okay. Tyler Jones, you think that's, that's right? Uh, not that that was my conclusion as well as you can apply to as many as you want. You just need to make sure because you're signing under penalties of perjury. So that's handcuffs. If you lie that you. <laughs> <laughs> right. All right. How is contribution to a 401k in 2019 factored into payroll cost calculation? If the doc was making over a hundred K and company was matching could all that match be included or just to 100K? I, I think that's actually a really good question that I'm not sure that we actually have the, the guidance on yet. Um, we've seen a few scenarios where uh, for, for docs who have, for example, like defined benefit plans um, that are potentially a couple hundred thousand dollars a year, how does that get included in the PPP calculation and uh, it's it's not a, it's not abundantly clear yet and so I think that the Treasury is going to be issuing some guidance on that but the the first part of the question in terms of the 401k for the employees I think that's absolutely uh, allowed to be included in in that spent that eight week spend period that you have um, again Brian mentioned that it needs to be paid and incurred so you might have to um, do something a little out of the ordinary and actually make the payment in that eight-week period where a lot, of, uh, a lot of them either wait till the end of the year to pay the employee match or they, they do it you know, quarterly or whatnot. So you might have to do something off-cycle just to get it paid. 
So yeah, there's, there's two parts to that question. One is in calculating the max PPP loan amount, which is your two and a half times average monthly payroll cost. We, we as I said, we did have a situation. We had a doc who had a uh, defined benefit plan and it, that in 2019 contributed roughly $400,000 for that doc. And so we said, okay, we got a $100,000 limit on the compensation component. How does that $400,000 factor in? Well, without guidance, we added the entire amount in calculating the average payroll cost. We'll see if it gets through. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, can the forgivable money be used to pay employee insurance premiums, even though the office might not be open before June deadline? Yes. Yeah, we, we think the answer to that is absolutely yes. Tyler Jones? I agree. Absolutely, yes. Okay. Uh, let's see. I think you've covered most of these. Uh, oh, have you heard anything about working Washington small business emergency grants? Some counties have already closed their application. Yeah, like almost instant. Yeah, yeah, those those applications that when that got announced, it's like they got flooded with applications, and most counties, uh, certainly King County, closed within hours. I think it was only ten million dollars, which, in the grand scheme of things, is it's it's just not very much money spread that many ways. But this this raises that raises a really good uh, point. I've uh, been hearing from a number of our clients regarding the uh, Delta Dental, uh, the RAF the grant program versus the advanced program. Mm -hmm. And early reading of what Delta posted on the grant program, they kind of, they built a profile of uh, kind of a likely recipient. And it sounded very much like uh, a doc earlier in their career, who maybe has practice debt, lots of student debt would be that, that profile that qualifies. I'm hearing more and more docs that are established, been in practice five years, 10 years, 12 years, um, don't necessarily have student debt and are beyond, at uh, one case was even beyond their practice uh, purchase debt, qualifying for those RAF grants. So I encourage you all to go chase them. And um, uh, you know, if you get a no initially, appeal it. I had one doc who raised two docs who raised a stink on their denials and ended up getting some grant money. So a clarification on that. If you have two doctors in a practice, an associate and the owner uh, dentist, uh, can both apply? Yes. That associate doc, if that associate doc is paid as a 1099 independent contractor, they're deemed as a self-employed business to stand alone. Uh, so the associate would apply off their own earnings, their own 1099 earnings, and the practice owner obviously based on the owner's earnings and W-2 uh, uh, comp that the practice pays. If that associate is a W-2 employee, the associate W-2 compensation is included in the practice owner's triple P calculations. Okay. My wife works for me as a bookkeeper and has a W-2 at the end of the year. However, when we filed for quarterly UI, she was excluded as an officer. Not sure if she can get her UI, but since she has a W-2 and works for me, can she still get the $600? So first of all, I hope that practice owner has really strong anti-embezzlement procedures in place. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, so the practice owner and the spouse of the practice owner are typically excluded officers in the uh, UI system. Again, they qualify under the CARES Act emergency rules. Wait until April 18th, again, as ESD has specified, and then go apply. Okay, another clarif clarification uh, question here. If we don't use all the PPP money in three weeks, or eight weeks, pardon me, we just pay remainder at 1% interest with six months deferred, yes? Yes, what doesn't get forgiven turns into a 
to your loan from the date of the forgiveness on that portion that is forgiven. So the balance then turns into a two-year loan, uh, 1% interest. The deferral, the, the deferral starts when they get their loan. So if uh, the bank is only giving them a six-month deferral, so say they get their triple P money today, and exactly six months from now they get the, that portion forgiven, the, the balance will be a two-year loan from that point, you know, with monthly payments due. Now, depending on the size of the loan, let's say you get, you know, 50% forgiven, say a $100,000 $100, loan, the $50,000 loan that's going to be paid back in two years is get a pretty healthy monthly, you know, payment just because of the short-term nature of it. Okay. If Inslee pushes back the day past May 18th, how does PPP change? We can't use the funds and lose everything? Question mark. PPP does well, refer change. Back. So uh, basically, if uh, uh, Inslee changes the date from May 18th, say to June 1st, and somebody has that PPP loan funded right now, are they going to be able to use any of those funds? Yeah, go back to the example in the slide deck when it gets sent out, uh, because we did build an example around that. The, the forgivable amount is, for the most part, going to be limited to compensation to the owner and or owner spouse if they also work in the business, uh, and a portion of the rent and utility payments. Here's an interesting question. We sold our practice September 2019, took a break, took over a new practice uh, February 11th, 2020. Can we qualify for PPP? No employees with new practice. Uh, well, one of the requirements is that you had to be in business February 15th. So they just snuck in under the wire there. What, did they, is this a scratch practice or they took over a practice? Uh, I don't know. It, it looks like they took over a new practice. So uh, if they have no employees, we would assume it's a scratch practice. Let's make that assumption. Okay. So the, the no employees is certainly going to um, limit the amount of their PPP loan. Uh, it's like Tyler mentioned earlier for self-employed Schedule C filers. It's going to depend on how much money they make in 2020. Uh, I think the question would be, well, how would they have, what would they qualify for in terms of a PPP? Because the, the Treasury issued some guidance that said for new companies, let's say it started January 2nd of 2020, they don't have anything retroactively to look at for 2019. So the Treasury said, okay, fine, you can use your Jan 1 through uh, Feb 28 numbers to calculate what your average payroll is and apply for a PPP based on that. And I actually had that exact circumstance happen with a client, and it was a really good answer. Uh, in this particular case, I think they're just going to be limited because they've only really got 17 days of potential income that's going to go into the calculation. So I'm just not sure it's going to help. Yeah, so if their net profit for that 17 days is zero or a loss. Then the answer is still zero. Yeah, it's two and a half times zero is still zero. Here, let me get out my calculator and double check that. <laughs> <laughs> All righty. Uh, what do I do if my PPP loan got approved today, but my income as a sole proprietor, Schedule C, got left out? Uh, I, I, I think you're, you're out of luck. I mean, I, that's quite frankly one of the reasons that we've requested for all of our clients that we review the calculations before it gets sent. Uh, but it's, it's clear that you only get one shot at it, and um, there, there's kind of no take back I think you're I think you're stuck with the smaller loan amount. Yeah. So this is, this is like my wife tells me when I try to tackle a project at home. Uh, I end up doing it three times, and she reminds me uh, maybe you should have just hired somebody to do that job. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, they're they're sat out of luck, unfortunately. 
All righty. Uh, you, you've answered a, a number of questions many, many times here, guys. Uh, you probably see there's a, a kind of a common theme or thread to some of those. Did this uh, stimulate any thoughts that you want to share with us before we uh, wind down this webinar today? Um, I, I think it, to reiterate what we've been telling our clients in terms of kind of Again, each practice is ultimately going to be different, but the general guidance that we are providing is that until your practice is open, there, there's no real math that makes bringing your employees back to sit on, sit on their thumbs where, where that really ultimately pencils. And I think ultimately you'll still, you're still going to be out the federal FICA and Medicare components to that. And so I think in an overwhelming number of, of, of situations, even if, even if the governor extends it until July and you got your money yesterday, I think you're still better off to, to not bring those people back because um, I, I just don't think it does you any good. Right. So what you end up with, you know, we're, we're all kind of got big saucer eyes thinking, oh, man, we're going to get all this free money. We're going to get this PPP loan and you're going to get it all forgiven. Well, just because of the circumstances, it's not going to all be forgivable. But if fifteen, twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 is forgivable, that's still a win. And you got to keep in mind, too, the, the other part of the remainder of the money is critical working capital for a lot of practices. It's it could be their their only pathway to survive this financial crisis and be able to get back on their feet. So, you know, at the end of the day, it's it's still a win-win. But I, Tyler and I are definitely definitely on the same page. We've run the math. It makes no sense to bring your employees back until you're open for business. I wouldn't spend the money just to spend it because once it's gone out in the form of payroll, yeah, okay, it gets forgiven, but then that is also then not available to roll into just a normal loan, as Brian mentioned, for working capital post-open. So I, it, it's not, I don't want to say it's wasted, but it's definitely not utilized. Yeah, it's wasted. <laughs> you can say that. So my other comment, I go back to, um, uh, you know, in the political arena is, what should the dental community be doing to lobby for your position to get back to work as soon as possible, as soon as safely possible, instead of having um, politicians, you know, arbitrarily push you out to mid-June, mid-July. I mean, down in Oregon, we saw uh, something put out by, what is their uh, Oregon Department of Health kind of setting the table for preemptively being allowed to push the dentists out to September 20. I mean, you might as well just shut them down, put them out of business. That's just insane. So d d my comment would be is what should the dental community be doing to protect your interests as business owners uh, and lobbying for that interest in the political arena? Okay. Uh, I'm just going through the questions here and just seeing if there was anything else. Uh, yeah, I'd, if our office can't open until June and we already have PPP funding, can we hire our kids to do busy work and pay them? <laughs> I would be very careful uh, about that. Uh, I mean, it's not explicitly prohibited, but you, you would ultimately have to justify the value of, of the work that the employees at that point are providing. I'd be very careful about that. Yeah, so if you're hiring your three-year-old to uh, shred documents, that's probably not believable. And if you're trying to pay your 10, 12-year-olds uh, $20, $30 an hour, that's also not believable. Um, you know, it goes back to there's, there's one golden tax rule that we always uh, tell our clients they have to be mindful of. And that uh, pigs get fat and hogs get slaughtered. So don't do something stupid, basically. 
And from screening some of these questions here in the Q&A, uh, I think you summed it up very well there, Tyler. Uh, it looks like some of these questions people are asking, they need to go out to their CPA and their attorneys. We just can't do this on a webinar and satisfy uh, all the answers for everybody out there. So with that, guys, uh, thank you very much. Uh, we'd like to thank uh, Benton Bray, the dental accounting pros, Helso Fetterman, pardon me, uh, yeah, is there anybody I'm missing in those thank yous? Oh, yes. Thank you to our executive direct, director, Valerie Bartoli. Uh, thank you, Dr. Presset, for your work on the website. We're trying to get that updated as quickly as possible. As soon as we get this slide deck from the guys, we'll get that up. And thank you, uh, Dr. Gary Hayamoto, for handling our chat and being a panelist here today. So with that, uh, we'll see you guys this afternoon at 1 o'clock for Dr. Alan Yassin. Dental implants, del del delayed complications, and peri-implantitis. You can sign up at WashingtonAGD.org. Thanks, guys. Thanks. Thank, Thank you. you.